um, uh, and I must push on with them. We have two more speakers. Um, our next speaker is Glenn, Glenn Dewhurst. Uh, I think, uh, yes, our, our, our penultimate speaker. Uh, he's the president of the 900 member strong Black Cockatoo Preservation Society. He's been caring for Black Cockatoo since 2004 and has handled well over 1,000 of these birds in his time. He's passionate and dedicated. Well, he would be, wouldn't you? I think I need to say that. Uh, advocate uh, for the cockatoos and their habitat. So, ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Dewhurst. Hey guys, thank you very much for that. Look, uh, listening to these speeches today, I've actually changed my thought twice now. So I'm actually, I'm actually going to wing it. Um, look, the reason being. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Okay. Uh, look, um, people ask me why I get into why I got into cockatoos. Okay, because I wanted to make the same for my life. I didn't want to just be someone who goes through the goes through their time that and. Uh, I looked at all different kinds of species, and um, so I looked at the cockatoos because I was looking at a species that was in rapid decline. I was also looking at, um, at a species that wasn't cute and cuddly, and um, because they do hurt when they do fight. And also, these, these cockatoos actually support a lot of other species, and other species of, um, of native flora, fauna, and also our fungi as well. They're very, very important for the survival of a lot of, a lot of species, and the way I say that is because there may be one or two other species, land-based species in Australia that cover it or need as much land as these guys do to survive. But if you save the habitat for the cockatoo, you'll save the habitat for a lot of other species as well. We, um, well we're finding though the cockatoos and, and deforestation that from the cockatoos that are coming in, when we first started we get probably one a week. We're now looking at one a day on average, uh, but we get reported of two deaths a day as well. This doesn't include the um, 150 to 200 we lost down at um, Hope Town two years ago. It doesn't include the um, 60 that was found on the orchard's property who we shot over a few weeks. And um, also doesn't include another orchard in the Round Nelson area who had 200 car carcasses on his property. Uh, all of them um, um, uh, non prosecutable. Was it prosecution? Prosecutable. We're also finding, thank you very much. We're also finding that um, the cockatoos that are coming in are coming in a lot lighter. Okay, carnivore cockatoos um, around about between 620 to 650. Nassos, red tails usually come in between 650 and up to 700. We're finding that each of the species has actually dropped weight by 150 to 200 grams of weight. That's a lot of weight. So for the mathematicians out there, when you think about it from if you, you weigh uh, your, your 600 grams and you've gone down to 400, 450, and that's a lot of money, that's a lot of um, body weight you're actually losing. Why is that? It's because of not getting the food. The last three years we have had a complete turnaround in the reason why the cockatoos are coming into our care, and it's because they're hungry. We, have, we do get them when they come in because they're only hit by cars and, or, um, or they've been shot. We do get that. Um, but we are finding most of our cockatoos are coming in now because they're hungry. And it's just sad. We go out and cut, and they don't, don't throw things at me, we go out and cut one and a half tonnes of native food per fortnight to feed the cockatoos in rehabilitation. They need it because we don't want to feed them on apples or anything like that, send them across the orchards, we don't want to feed them on, native, on, on, um, on seed. But where we do cut, we cut along the side of the roads where a lot of developers and the government says, let's put green belts alongside the roads. The reason we cut along there is because the cockatoos, when they're feeding, when they go to take off, they're heavy, they actually drop down in front of the cars and trucks and get smacked. So we'll actually go down there and cut along there. But one thing that we have found though, a lot of these places that where we have cut the trees and we have cut along the sides of the roads, is that these trees are actually coming back. Now the scientists out there need to tell me why this is happening. I've got, I've got a theory. These trees have come back with, with fruit, season after season, and the reason we believe they've done that is because historically when the cockatoos were in their large numbers, they used to go through and triple the trees. The trees on our properties get hit by the cockatoos all the time. We don't have any sick or dying trees on our property. Actually, no, I like to hear. We do after this last summer because of some of them because of the water. But We've gone through and we're actually pruning as the cockatoos do. We've done on the banks, we've done the, the bank shears along the brand highway. And these some of these bank shears have actually come back quite fruitful. So without the cockatoos, the trees aren't coming back. So I know I know you to have five minutes, but all I want to say is without the trees, you won't have cockatoos. Without the cockatoos, I'm telling you now, you're not going to have the trees. Yeah. You need to save them. We are we do, we have done a lot of environmental work. We give a lot of information, we spend a lot of time out there in the forest 
watching the cockatoos and how they behave. We can release, and we've shown this time and time again, we've released cockatoos back into the family groups up to 12 months, 18 months, and two years later after they've been in care, the cockatoos are taken back. We also have released cockatoos into wrong flocks as well for making mistakes. And unfortunately, these cockatoos are left there to fend for themselves. So these cockatoos do need to go back into the, into the family groups. I'm going to take a big jump now. The big jump is, is we, up until about 12 months ago, we were helping a lot of community groups in regards to, um, for Brigadoon, Shenton Park, um, and other places as well. And we would blow the Environment Department reports right out of the water in regards, right out of the water, yeah, right out of the woods, um, in regards to their statements of why um, clearing and tree felling can occur. But what happens is it come at a price. We were threatened with legal action from the people because uh, they said if you take us to court, you lose, you lose your house. I've got a young family, they probably have their fact for me now. Um, and we also um, denied funding. And um, we're denied funding because of our of we were talking and we we're telling the truth. We weren't, we weren't lying. We had people coming up to us who said, "We're going to have this land cleared here. The cockatoos are here. We're going to have a look." And sometimes we say, "There's no evidence the cockatoos here." We put our hand up to that. But the cockatoos are there. We we'll tell you, the cockatoos are there. Prime example is uh, is uh, Shadowstone Hospital. We went out there and we looked out there at Shadowstone Hospital. We saw the cockatoos come through. We spoke up about it, we protested against it. As a result of that, half the funding for the rehab of the cockatoos went to another organisation who doesn't have cockatoos at all. They've not been out there once to collect cockatoos. It's very expensive, it comes out of our pockets, all of these pockets, all this stuff does. <coughs> so, there's a lot of games and things that have been played on. A friend over there spoke about it, um, about the Department of Environment Conservation. They get, don't get me wrong, they actually got some good mates who work for them, They're very, very keen. The guys on the work ground, actually on the ground, are very nice guys and decent people. They want to make a difference. But how are we going to make a difference? I've seen a lot of groups over the years come up and fall away, do some really good work, but because they're not being heard. I just want to finish on saying is, not until such time as we all get together as a voice and as a group and have some wins, are we going to, we're going to actually make a difference? Some of you may disagree with that, but I think that's the only way it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Cockatoo's uh, use as a, as a hedge trimmer. If only they could replace the leaf blower as well. Then <laughs> um, finally, uh, lovely Glenn, thank you very much. Our last speakers uh, uh, come a friend of mine uh, just through communicating about this to one of the women. She's spokesperson for the WA Forest Alliance and the chair of the Walpole Bay South Coast Environmental Group. She's been campaigning for the protection of WA Forest since '97, and when she went on a weekend, when she went on a weekend trip to a blockade camp and never got back on the charts. That's a very good uh, Jess won the WA Youth Leadership Award for a contribution to non-violent culture and stability of the blockade camps in the 1990s uh, when she was in her late teens. Since then, she's continued to campaign for the forest using a variety of methods and approaches. She's also an environmental science student and a mum to two young children. She's our last speaker. She organises GIG along with the rest of the Forest Alliance and her presentation will be followed by a short bout of questions. So please welcome Jess. Thank you very much, and thank you to you all for coming. I'll just try and work out how to do this this time. First part of organising anything, I hate the techie stuff. It frightens me, but then I get that. Okay. So yeah, thank you to you all so much for coming <coughs> along this afternoon to be a part of this growing movement to protect the native forests. You're the cream of the WA crop in my mind, the, um, the people who can handle the heat, the people who recognise that there's a problem and want to do something about it and ask what there is that, that you personally can do and that, that's really special. We are, we're in crisis. Uh, I don't know when it happened but there's a new kind of crazy busyness that's hit everybody. Uh, we're all sort of struggling to, to keep up with ourselves and, and more than ever before to find that lucid balance between the various responsibilities and joys in our lives and we become absolutely bombarded with information about how terrible things are and how much worse they're getting 
and the evidence on the effects of climate change is piling up and, and there's the unbearable animal cruelty that I'm sure so many of you acted upon but, but turned away from when the images came up on the television. And the natural human response to this inundation is denial. And it's perfectly understandable and it's all around us, but in my mind it's also the biggest threat. So it's impressive that you're here. It really is. And it's impressive that you came instead of staying home and cracking a beer or checking your mail or reading the paper or um, changing your profile picture, watching the sport. So thank you very much for coming. The good news, I think, the, the thing that keeps so many people attuned to the forest campaign and, and, and the issues around the forest is that this is an achievable goal. And it's, an, it's a local issue and something that's intensely personal to us. Uh, when we see the trees dying around Perth and in the southwest, that pay me under immense strain. And like many of you, I can't help but think about the birds and the other animals that won't have homes to come back to and the enormous competition between them um, to find somewhere to nest and feed. And it is horrible to think about, but we plainly have to do something. The um, peers touched on this uh, lightly before. The Centre for Excellence for Climate Change, Woodland and Forest Health, have just reported on what they call a sudden massive canopy failure in the northern Jarrah Forest. I'm just going to mention this very, very briefly. Um, these are some of the photographs that were taken um, uh, from the flyover the northern Jarrah Forest. Uh, they found that 8.8% or around like 1,600 hectares of the air of the northern Jarrah Forest are simply dying. And another 5% on top of that um, are yellowing and, and, and will die in, in the near future. And now this is, um, the uh, drought is causing this, that's clear, but what's exacerbating it is uh, that the forests are in such a vulnerable, vulnerable position. It's the legacy of wood chipping and the introduction of of dieback, uh, the, the spread of dieback and the introduction of other pests and disease, and the clearing of, of our forests for mining, um, and the forests, particularly these in the, the low and medium rainfall zones, as the EPA said in their report in August last year, just simply can't cope anymore. And now this desperate ecological state of affairs has become economic, and, and many of us are prone to say uh, once in a while that um, you can't have an economy without an environment. Well, here's the proof that, that none of us wanted to, to see. When Guns, the biggest um, company left in the, in the native forest uh, sector in Western Australia, relented eventually and closed their last native forest sawmill in February, it was because nobody wanted to buy it. Um, that's all the evidence that we need that uh, the saw log industry, the native forest saw log industry, is simply no longer economically viable. As also has been mentioned tonight, the Forest Products Commission posted a loss of more than $20 million last financial year. And now by the very, the most generous estimates, and this is something that really needs to be cleared up, um, but by the most generous estimates, they're just breaking even. So that means there is no return to the state from the destruction of our forests. It's happening for no good reason. In fact, we're paying for it to happen. Um, so look, this isn't, this, this economic unviability, if that's a term for it, isn't it? Um, it comes as no surprise. In, in 1977, the Forest Department then predicted that it was 25 years of timber resource at current logging levels. And that was in fact during the, the uh, enormous decline in rainfall that's occurred since then. Um, so they knew that by 2002, the forest wouldn't be able to provide the timber necessary to maintain a soil log industry, which is exactly what we're witnessing. And now as the ship sinks, there's a mad grab for the last good quality saw logs. This is Crow Air Forest. A lot of you were involved, no doubt, in the, in the campaign, um, probably have been involved in the campaign since the 70s. Um, this, um, this forest is one of the forests that should have been protected at the 2001 election. It's a high conservation value forest alongside the Warren River near Pemberton. Uh, it was logged last month. It was home to a colony of endangered mainland quokkas. A lot of people don't even know that there are mainland quokkas and there might not be <laughs> in the near future. Uh, this is Helms Forest. This is Deirdre Patterson. She, like Glenn Dewhurst, is one of the best friends that the cockatoos in this state <coughs> could ever ask for. Her and her partner David have been looking after the cockatoos around now for more than 20 years. Um, Helms Forest is still on the logging plans um, and it's, it's an extraordinary area. In fact, we'll, we'll have a rally there later in the year to call for its protection and I really hope that that you can join us. 
the Pedersons wanted to release a flock of Carnaby and Borden's cockatoos uh, here, in, it's on their boundary where they're able to keep an eye on them if they need extra food or, or anything in October last year, but they couldn't in good conscience because it's on the logging plan. So they went to the Department of Environment Conservation to request if maybe there was another area that, that uh, they might be able to, to release them into, um, but found that everywhere around them was either on the logging plan or was about to be burnt. The forest that was burnt, where they, that, that, that was suggested to them, ended up, as so many fires are these days, escaping, burning out of control. 12,500 hectares of forest was burnt. 70% <coughs> of the crown was fully scorched. And after that, it takes five or six years before seed will be produced again. So that area has been wiped out for cockatoos for five or six years. So it's, they're in the aviary and, and they're safe there, but obviously the persons would rather be able to release them. So this is how it's. It takes 250 to 300 years for hollows to develop in married trees. So no rot no logging rotation. Um, you know that only a only a mature ecosystem is able to support these cockatoos. This is a carnaby um, at home in Helms, and that is one of the trees that that is still threatened with logging. Now we just simply can't allow, in all good conscience, the forests, either the high conservation value ones all the vast areas that are only now able to provide low grade logs to continue to be logged at a loss. And this is what we mean by the forest being at the crossroads. I hope that tonight or this afternoon you've gained an understanding of the fact that change is, is inevitable in the native forest uh, logging industry. We're in the best political and economic situation now that we've been in for 10 years to see a change happen. The problem is that change isn't necessarily going to be protection. It may well be the introduction of this biomass, native forest biomass industry. So because they're not making any money, they need to find a new way to pop up the industry. <coughs> or the logical next step is the full protection of our native forests and the proper promotion of sustainably managed plantations and, and farm forestry. So, We've made it nice and easy for you with the um, petitions and, and letters that we handed out at the door. I hope that if you've been convinced by the presentations tonight, you'll fill those in and leave them with us. Please also, if you are able to, make a donation because all of these events that we put on are, are run on donations and, and we're on a very uh, tight budget. Um, secondly, please check our website um, regularly. The events that we're planning will, will be put up on there. Um, and, um, and look, most importantly, talk to people. As you've heard tonight, the, the way that a community campaign works, the good ones work because people talk to the people that they're in a group with, whether you're at, at church with people, at work with people, you cycle with people, talk to them and tell them that you came to this forum and you found out that there's this terrible thing happening, but that we can do something. This is something, something local that we really can do to, um, to benefit our climate and also to benefit these local endemic species that we've discussed. Very briefly, because I promised I'd raise this, one of the, um, one of the um, four letters that you have is about the Witcher Scar. It's just outside of Margaret River. It's one of the most extraordinarily beautiful parts of our state. It's home to some incredible <coughs> endemic species and it also has been under a lot of threat, uh, a, a lot of um, pressure from mining. BMAX Resources want to expand their mining operations there, and the EPA have, have rejected it outright. They haven't said, perhaps, if you're going to go ahead with it, do it in these ways. They've just simply said, don't do it, it's under too much pressure. The Mines Minister, Norman Moore, has very cynically put out some public statements pressuring the Environment Minister to reject the EPA's recommendation. And we need to really support the EPA when they make um, findings like this. So please um, fill in that form letter and put a personal comment on it. And uh, there's also a petition out the front. It would be fantastic if you can sign that. We've also got a finally a, um, a public planning meeting uh, on the 6th of August. It'll be up on the website. Yes, is a very splendid person and very, very uh, succinct and articulate. All our speakers joining us now. If you do have to leave, do shuffle out. We'll have going to have half an hour's worth of questions uh, for those of you that want to stay. Um, obviously, the technology has been splendid. I personally would have preferred a 
blackboard because not only does it work, but it's also a carbon uh, source uh, which uh, keeps some carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, so, uh, my, mine's very quick answer about the question about the solar panels. Um, the, oh, the, <laughs> the payback period is about a year and a half, oh, um, straight by the Medoff University. Um, so you get the energy back in about a year and a half. So can we just hear this? Uh, this is an answer to the question on solar panels. Your answer louder is? Uh, it's about a year and a half, the, the payback period. There's a study by Medoff University. Mm. And uh, so they have a life cycle of uh, about 15 years. So you get it back pretty quickly. So the answer is that they are. They're, they're good they, do use, uh, they do use up less. They do more good than harm. That's, uh, that's good news to hear, because my room's covered in them. Nothing can scandal in the uh, Fremantle Herald. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's energy. And greenhouse gas So the, the answer is that they consume less energy than they save. So that's good news. Uh, the gentleman with the beard at the back had his hand up first. Sorry. Um, panel, you've been talking so far mainly about regional forestry. In my mind, I think we've got a real issue across the whole of this country, including the cities, of loss of native vegetation. I wonder what the panel thinks about a blanket ban on cutting down Australian trees. I think it's a really un-Australian thing to do to cut down any Australian vegetation. I think there's a broad base of support for that because you know New South Wales and Queensland have got you know, legislation um, that regulates, if not prevents, clearing native vegetation. So I think, uh, you know, certainly in those two states, um, in Victoria now, there, you know, there is legislation which has got popular support um, from both sides of politics for uh, uh, you know, preventing or at least regulating the, the, the clearance of native vegetation. And in Queensland, that was a huge turnaround. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's, um, it's an unbelievable change in Queensland. Now that's not to say it still hasn't happened because there's all sorts of wriggle room. But you know, I, I, I actually think that there's quite a broad base of support you know, in Australia for native vegetation compared to what there was even even ten years ago. So I'm a little bit more optimistic that things are you know things are turning around in that direction. Okay, if I can answer just two in on that. <clears throat> when I was on Mundari Show at Council. We actually put through a motion at the Mundari Shire Council, and I believe a lot of other councils followed suit, that people need permission to clear any native, to, to, to cut down or even prune any substantial native tree. So whether it still exists, I don't know, but, but um, I believe Shire Council is our picking up on it. If I can just quickly add, from the Conservation Council's perspective, we've been uh, calling for an end to uh, native vegetation clearing in Western Australia for some time now. We do have native vegetation clearing regulations here in Western Australia, but they're failing. They're not working. Uh, the Auditor General has reviewed them and found that they're failing, and there's been a separate independent review to that that's also found that they're failing. Uh, but the government hasn't uh, taken the initiative to do anything about that. So we, we do have a, a severe uh, problem with vegetation loss, particularly on the Swan Coastal Plain, uh, with um, industrial development and also housing development. And a lot of these areas have been zoned for development a long time ago, and so they're exempt from the native vegetation clearing regulations. So that's something that uh, is also a serious concern. So a good excuse not to do the weeding. Um, then, uh, they get um, I'm an early childhood teacher and I've been involved with early childhood for more than years. One of the questions that's been very keen in my mind, and congratulations to Claire for the comments about the books not mine, is the increase of heavy metals in the development of children in the health and development of the pathways to the brain. And there has been a 22% increase in autism in the inner inlet in the last period of time. I'm not sure exactly about those statistics. But is that something that's also discussed with the you did have the Aladdin market, I mean, it is huge in the metropolitan area as well. Also, down in the management region, which has a very, very large mental health problem. We'll come, we just don't come to grips with, with the risk from the economy, you know, but we haven't gone as far as looking at other things that might be, I suppose, liberated. And of course, there is a 
Latin, once about it was Latin. And when I was working in the world, I was a real fool in this art. So they offered me a job. <laughs> and a very nice salary to try and remove the thorn. Well, I told them what they could do with the job. Because when I looked at it carefully and I recognised the politics involved inside that department, you cannot, you, you cannot, I've seen a lot of people, a lot of good people work for Khan. Go into Khan working for them and they were good people. And it takes 12 months at the outside for them to be politically compromised. Mm -hmm. So, what about shareholding? I mean, that's another issue. I'm very early in our battle. Um, in 2009, <coughs> I bought the minimum number of shares I could in all site resources. <coughs> so I could attend their meetings. And I went to the first meeting that they had. Uh, and I was the only woman in the room, that's just a, a side thing. And basically, um, we were heavy, I was heavy, and they tried to sort of tackle me after the meeting, and I just, it's very hard to explain. They are such toxic people, yeah. you cannot talk to them. And Derek, the other convener of r 4 and I made the decision very early, after very few discussions with them, that this is not something we could do. It's like dealing with the devil. I don't know, don't know if you're aware, that the Barry Carlton, yeah, is the chairman. The chairman of, uh, of um, or rather the chief executive officer, the BRL, used to be the chairman of the DNC. Yeah, the chairman of the So, you know, political uh, machinations. There's a lady there for the gentleman. <laughs> is that the bottom leave system isn't working. We're seeing drought deaths, but also systemic decline from unknown source, uh, causes. Mm. Just wondering if you'd like to uh, hazard a few guesses as to how we should change our management to allow us to better adapt to climate change. Yeah, stop paying for it well, now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That'd be a good start. Um, but don't burn it. Don't burn it. Another one. Um, I mean, I didn't mention this, but you know, the, the burning regime that the Department of Environment and Conservation are applying to our forests is actually systematically uh, reducing the carbon storage in those forests as well, and particularly in the forest soil. Um, so that's another one we've got to take some, some time to look at. Uh, and of course, we're also facing a situation with dieback and other forest diseases. Uh, which are uh, extremely under-resourced and poorly managed in the sense that uh, the Department of Environment is, um, you know, just hasn't got the resources to properly tackle these issues. So that, that's probably a third thing that I would say that we have to um, look at seriously as well. Yeah, I mean, we can't make it rain, but we can take away all of the other pressures. What we can, we can take away the clearing and the logging, which will support the forest to be able to recover in the way they're going to be able to recover. Selection is a very powerful force, you know, because uh, over the course of time it ensures that the best you know, genome and phenotype um, persists or evolves um, you know, for the prevailing conditions. So uh, the, the natural biodiversity of the forest is, is, uh, is what gives ecosystems their adaptive capacity and, and their 
resilience. I mean, what we know as climate change kicks in, ecosystems are going to change. In fact, if they didn't, it would be deeply problematic. So they're going to, uh, species composition will change, ecosystem dynamics will, will, will change. I'm, I'm completely unconvinced that humans have the knowledge or the power to um, it, intervene and, and, and do heavy, you know, heavy management, you know, anticipate the changes and, you know, garden the forest so that it will, you know, um, uh, uh, adapt accordingly. I really think we have to think about um, how we can, as the other panellists were saying, remove the stresses of humans are putting on and think about how we can allow these natural adaptive processes to kick in. I, I, I really think that's the, that's the key in the long term. Uh, no, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm sort of just trying to a challenging <laughs> idea here. Um, I read very happily in a newspaper that Scotland, the country, is hoping to be totally sustainable energy in 2020. How far away is that? Sure, Scotland's going to hardly meet that one. <laughs> 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 so there's a which carefully looked at precisely on that subject. On the subject of houses, uh, who's doing the lead table sustainability? Yes, everything that you've been talking about. Oh, you well, won't we, listen. We don't always want to look at the web. We look at the human well, the website, website, the website um, is GDA or Alright, it's geaorg.au, sir. So that's you sort of made that clear. Okay. okay. So, so uh, this gentleman yeah. over there. Yeah. Okay, guys. Um, also, please, Glenn, because you're not the only one who costs everything for the government. It's not happening what you're doing, so. Um, but in terms of, of, in terms of wording of documents and yeah. naming petitions, um, people need to think about the words and their legal meanings because the word petition essentially is to beg and to ask and to ask is to beg and you give the authority and the consent away for a proper answer. You should direct them to do something, you should direct them not to do something and you should declare your will. This is a representative government, you are being represented, you can actually officially declare your will of representation and you can't come back with a complaint. <laughs> Uh, would say about that. Petitions have had their have worked in the past. I'm minded of the Chartist Revolution, but yes, they're very good point. Um, Madam, back there. Yeah, I was following up from what this gentleman just, just said about the words we use. Is it possible when you write into the premier and you want people like me to sign, which I'm doing, that, that rather than using dear premier, mm. <laughs> you say Mr. Premier? I'm, I'm really serious about this. I think the use of the word dear constantly minimalises and trashes a lot of the things. Well, I think it's a linguistic convention, but I mean, these days. That's what we say to you. He's most representing us, they're representative. Well, Mr. Premier, or we could go all email and just go to hi. When you address, I personally think it's an acceptable sort of convention, of, but anyway, it's one to think about. Uh, Madam, is it purple at the back then? Yeah. Um, I was wondering if um, you thought there were any problems with controlled burnings, if there were any good effects. Sorry? Um, if there were any positive effects of controlled burnings. Yeah. yeah. You know, there have been uh, controlled burnings, really very very controversial uh, from an ecological perspective. The big, the, right, clearly fire needs fuel. So logically, if there's fuel around, it will burn. But what constitutes fuel really depends upon um, how hot it is, it's like how hot the fire is. And the fires that you know we really worry about are the big mess. Cannot help, physically cannot help with extreme fire events because they're driven by extreme weather. When you're talking about smaller scale fire, when you're talking about um, uh, property and, and where humans live and the fuel loads around those places, I think it's a, it's a, different, it's a different story. 
So I think we've got to answer that question in terms, you know, it's very context specific, you know, in terms of um, what you're talking about, where you're talking about, and, and the conditions that prevail. We need to broader, broad, more time to consider, sadly we don't, we don't have it. I can only take a couple more questions, well, the gentlemen. Can I, just, can I just chip in on, on briefly, the yes. early one? <laughs> Up until 15 years ago, I was a very experienced fire control officer for the Bushfire Board. Mm -hmm. My experience has been that you can burn off all you like, but if the conditions are right for a wildfire, the wildfire will go through anyway. You will not stop a wildfire. You might slow it down, but you won't stop it. And the other thing, the other thing is, I believe that the Department, Department of Environment and Conservation have forgotten what the word controlled burns means. <laughs> because they're not controlling them. They are firebombed by aircraft over an area of 20,000 hectares and there is no way that can ever be a control burn. Absolutely. The only way a control burn can be done is by troops on the ground controlling. Very good point. We've actually got very big issues in front of us. All of the climate models for southwest Western Australia are saying we're going to get hotter and drier up to 60% drier by 2070, some of the models are saying. We're seeing tipping points already. This year just showed some of the areas dying. They're huge when you get up in an aeroplane and see them die. You get onto the ground, small trees are dead, big trees are dead, across species are dead. That Jarrah forest, that, that those highland bits of forest are in a tipping point, we meet an ecosystem tipping points that some parts of the chert forest have already met their tipping point. We, to go back and get a chert forest there, we will have to plant trees. There's no seed bank. These are really real issues we're meeting. Things are happening so fast, we're not going to, maybe, maybe many of these species won't have time to adapt. Other species will come in, as you suggested. But it is happening so fast, things are not going to be able to adapt. So the question is, can we help things adapt? Can we, can we do things to that forest to allow it time to adapt? So the cockatoos and other things can adapt, other species, the reptiles. The biodiversity in Western Australia is phenomenal. That's why I'm here, why I love it, why I'm working on climate change, woodland and forest health in the centre. There are real issues. We are meeting tipping points. What are we going to do about it? We're talking about these forests now, and about fire and things like that. But really, we've got something much more substantial going on in my mind. And we need and to I, I, I doubt we'll be able to cover it in anything. I mean, I think what we're discussing here is trying to stop further logging and certainly logging in order to burn logs. Um, very briefly, I mean, sir, that's obviously a we're all well made point, but how to. Uh, well, I mean, I think we all agree that we need to be thinking about <laughs> ways we can help the forest, not, you know, uh, help the forest adapt to these. Uh, uh, and first we need to the forest. And uh, <laughs> the way to do, you know, one, one thing we can do is minimise the stresses that are placed on it and start thinking, as you say, about those things that can be free to be done. One of, the things we, one of the things we could do, instead of, instead of losing $25 million of taxpayers' money, pay the forest at any rate, let them stay at home and leave the forest at home. <laughs> Carry forest is in this week's paper from 117,000 cubic meters to 170,000 cubic meters. So, what can we do politically uh, for the information to share to stop that happening? Well, there's a the, the, the forest management plan, is, as somebody was saying, is, it, it's a 10 year plan um, that sets the allowable cup and that it's, it, it's supposed to stay at that for the 10 years. And, and, but in order to change, it does need to go for a public comment period. I think we've got until the 5th of August. The thing is, is that right? Um, until yeah. the 5th of August yeah. to make those comments. Um, so we encourage you to write to. Um, have to make our presence felt. You have to write to your website. MLA. Not yeah. on the website. Yeah. 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 So, sorry, Keith, if you, if you go to, to the website, which is um, wa forest alliance.org, there'll be information.
information on there about, and, and it's absolutely critical. I mean, it's going in the wrong direction as the information keeps coming to the fore about um, how <coughs> we've all been saying the stresses need to be removed from the forest so that it is able to adapt to climate change. And, um, instead, the Forest Commission are talking about increasing the cut in the carry. And it's we, something that it, it would really well, make a difference for if, if people do write to the EPA. I think another point in that too is basically they're doing this because you see we're, we, we're nine years into the forest management plan. They've already been cutting 170,000 hectares a year. This is, this is an afterthought just to cover their arses. They've already been cutting that amount. They've been over cutting for the last nine years. We have two more minutes, so Madam, you were anxious to say something. Um, I just wanted to um, ask, to try and clarify, um, uh, regarding the carbon tax that we're supposed to be getting, I guess, next year. Um, is that going to be increased by carbon tax? Is that what you're talking about? Things like, well, you can just cut down the mega forest and plant pine um, um, palm oil instead. So you can plant plantations, but. A very good question. What's the carbon tax impact on the forest? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the way the government's proposing to set up the legislation, native forests won't basically be involved in this first round of activity. They're also going to be bringing in a kind of parallel bit of legislation called carbon. CFI, carbon, sorry, carbon Farming Initiative, which also will largely exclude native forests as well. So, but the, the little bit of offsetting that will be allowed under these schemes will be largely to do with new plantings on previously cleared land. And because of the kind of complexities you were alluding to, the currently native forests will most likely not be, not, not be involved, which means the carbon in them won't have an economic value. So fossil fuel carbon will be, have a value, um, and there will be a little bit of farm carbon brought in. But, uh, so they won't be protected in terms of the carbon. Or harm. No, I think the answer is is that the carbon tax can't be used as an excuse to cut down trees. So that's not, oh, that might be a no, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to a bit more proactive uh, than that in terms of protection because if it doesn't, if the carbon tax isn't going to add to the protection really available, then it may well be the opposite effect and um, uh, provide incentives to the fire and fuel fire massive or whatever. That's right. So that's, that's, that's uh, spot on and, and the, that's what the big policy debate is at the moment because there's a whole lot of people who are concerned about the perverse outcomes whilst others are trying to, you know, get money to flow. Because I know the Conservation Council was able to campaign for a carbon tax, but I didn't see anything in the future about how that was actually going to protect native Well, it, it, it may not. It may, it, the way it's currently being designed, it's going to be largely quarantined around fossil fuel carbon. Mm -hmm. they, so they, so it's in the right they, direction, in my opinion. If they put a carbon penalty on, on logging native forest, Forest for Arts Commission may get even bigger loss. Just from the conservation council's perspective, yes, we support a carbon tax or a, a price on carbon, any sort of price on carbon, whether it's a tax or an emissions trading scheme, uh, as, a, as a whole of economy instrument. Uh, but it's up to the government to to, to bring that in. And, and currently, um, as as has been described, the proposal is for a fairly narrowly focused. Uh, carbon price regime. We do need to have that including native forests, but we need to have that happen under an accounting regime uh, which is accurate to the science rather than the existing accounting regime which is prescribed in the Kyoto Protocol, which was established a long time ago uh, and uh, potentially has some of these um, perverse incentives built in. So, yeah. so we, we need a, a carbon price, uh, but we need to apply that to forests in a way that uh, respects the, the, the science of the situation.
regime, rather than a political refined um, carbon accounting regime, which is just supporting a continuation of the logging industry. Yeah. Yeah. A very, a very good answer indeed, and a very good final question. I'm sorry not to have been able to take every question. Uh, I do want to thank, I hope some of the politicians are still with us. It's important to thank them for coming, because in the long run, they have the most influence. Uh, Thanks to Sally Tolbert, Scott Ludlam, Peter Tinley, Lynn McLaren, Giz Watson and Alison Zamon for joining us. And do please ask some of the questions raised here on the floor of the MLA. It is a matter of life and death. My final uh, very pleasant duty, I do hope these are not um, native Australian wildlife. Uh, they've certainly been harvested. Um, uh, Jess initiated and expanded uh, uh, and uh, organised this, this event. Well, congratulations on a wonderful event. From the old guard to the new guard. And this is a total of their appreciation. All the old trustees. Other than to please all thank them so much for being.